So welcome DCACM members and guests. We have an outstanding webinar session planned today. I'm Shahnaz Kamberi, current chair of DCACM. Before we start, we want to take a few moments to share the DCACM goal and introduce our leadership team. So our current vice chair is Catherine McClintock and our current treasurer is Anthony Clark. With over 100,000 members, the ACM is an association for computing professionals and students. We are the DC area chapter of ACM, and our goal is to create professional development and networking opportunities for our members. We thank our members for joining us today, and we encourage today's visitors to become a part of our growing community. As you can see, we have a group on meetup.com and the link is on this slide. We have 682 technical peers in the group. Some of our upcoming events are listed on your screen and we hope you can join us on all of them. If you're interested in presenting in our web series or have a tech talk idea, please email askenberry at dcacm.org. We would like to thank our distinguished speaker tonight and also DeVry University for providing this Adobe Connect environment. It is now our pleasure to introduce Parallel Computer Architecture and Interconnection Networks. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Barry Douglas. Dr. Douglas received his Aeronautical Engineering Bachelor's degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. He received his MBA from the University of Texas in Austin. He began his career as an engineer in the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. After several years, years in the industry, Dr. Douglas returned to school to get a PhD in Computer Systems Engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. His degree covered digital electronics, computer architecture, and control systems theory. Dr. Douglas was an assistant professor of electrical engineering at Texas A&M University and later was a self-employed researcher developing patents. He is currently a member of the faculty and faculty chair at DeVry University in the College of Engineering and Information Sciences. During the presentation, please feel free to ask questions. To ask a question of the speaker, simply type your question in the provided chat area in the lower right of your screen. If you are on Twitter, we hope you will join the conversation at hashtag DCACMWebinar at DCACM. Stay in touch via our Twitter and our website. The information is currently on your screen. We look forward to hearing from you. Dr. Douglas, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, oh good. Okay, I wasn't sure. I saw yes, but I didn't know if that was me. All right, so let me, um, I'm going to pull up a document that is a PowerPoint that has um, my brief presentation on it. It's really a set of pictures. So I'm going to talk and I'm going to refer to pictures. And um, the pictures are hand drawn because I don't have a good drawing package, but I think they came out pretty clearly. So they achieve what I want. And I'm talking while I'm trying to pull this up. So hopefully it'll work. And holding my breath. Oh, I've got upload. I guess it's converting. Oh, here we go. It's happening. So <clears throat> just give me a second. Once we get going here, I'll be able to tell you all about my interest in parallel computing, but right now I'm kind of holding my breath that this is going to work. All right, so it looks like everybody is getting it. Um, I, I didn't realize it takes so long to do this. I'm not sure why it has to convert. It is a PowerPoint, but in any event. Well, I guess I can go ahead and start. Well, here, oh, here we go. It's it's doing it. Okay. So now, does everyone see uh, like full screen uh, the title page? Massively parallel computing. Good. Yes, we okay. can, Dr. Douglas. Okay. Well, the reason I want to do it this way is that way I can still see what you're typing because actually, even though 
we were talking about maybe having questions at the end. I have no problem interrupting what I'm saying to uh, go ahead and, um, and answer questions as we go along. And so now what I'm trying to do is figure out, oh, here we go. I bet that's the next one. Well, let me, let me just tell you, massively parallel computing is the topic of the day. And uh, the first item I have is a sheet that has the topics on it. So what is massively parallel computing? And massively parallel computing is distinct from, from the kind of parallel computing we're seeing uh, put into, for example, uh, an Intel quad core, or now we have six processors in a single uh, core. Because parallel, a massively parallel computing envisions the idea of having thousands Someday, perhaps even millions of processors, though that's obviously pretty far in the future. The idea behind massively parallel computing came about when uh, microprocessors became fairly inexpensive. And people started to ask, well, why can't we just have a bunch of them in a box instead of having these very expensive uh, mainframe computers? We could just take uh, 30, 50, 100, maybe um, you know, 500 processors, each of them costing a relatively small amount of money compared to a mainframe computer, uh, put them together and let them process in parallel. Well, that was a great idea when it came out. It came out in the 1980s, pretty much as soon as the uh, small microprocessors were made available. Uh, the power of those microprocessors has only increased and their prices have gone down. And yet we still don't have massively parallel computing, uh, except in certain very special cases. So. The question you might ask is, how come? Well, I got my PhD looking at this problem and managed, fortunately, to make a very small contribution to what is, to this day, an unsolved problem. So I'm going to go through what are the issues, how you can make it work, and what are the things that are missing to make it work properly. So the first thing we can talk about is the hardware. And um, just to go to the next slide, which has a picture of the hardware, the idea behind a massively parallel computer is, and I'm sorry for the quality of the slides, but the idea is that you would have a processor P and a memory uh, tied to it. So that would be like what you would have inside your ordinary um, PC box, or it could be even something like a Raspberry Pi, one of those tiny single board computers. But then you would have a whole bunch of them inside a very large box. They would all be connected together. So the idea then would be that you would find a way to use this structure to allow each of the processors to be occupied most of the time doing useful work. Now, obviously, if you're going to have the, each of them doing something totally different, like you would have, for example, on a server farm today, that's not really a parallel computer. That's just a server farm. Each one is doing something totally independent of the others. Each is working on a problem that has no relationship to the others. So that's not really a massively parallel computer. That's just a lot of computers in one room. So the idea behind a massively parallel computer, a massively parallel processor, is that the machine would be designed to work essentially on a single problem, but a single problem that had many facets, where many things could be done simultaneously, without the restriction that they would have to be all independent. So if they're all independent, they're not necessarily uh, a single problem. But there are times in, in many problems when the steps that you're executing don't have to be sequential. Traditional programs are wit written sequentially primarily because that's how the, the, the human mind is going to generate the, the uh, program, not because that's the way it has to be done. Typical uh, Programmers are going to try to develop a sequence of steps that are interconnected, but if there's something that isn't necessarily following from the step right before it, that doesn't mean they're not going to put it afterwards because it has to go somewhere. It has to go in sequence. Recent computers have taken advantage of certain natural parallelism in the types of work that the processors are doing. For example, in a quad-core processor, you might be using a word processor. At the same time, you're working on some, um, uh, developing some display work. So your, your computer is trying to generate a picture at the same time as it's uh, doing some word processing, at the same time as it may be doing some other background activity. Each of those is a separate activity 
all within the computer. But that's not really parallel processing because they're working on separate problems. They just happen to be all needed to make that machine work. So what are the kinds of problems you might run into that would call for parallel processing? Well, in a sense, one of the reasons that parallel processing has become an interesting topic is that artificial intelligence researchers have noticed many of the things they would like to be able to do in artificial intelligence don't work very well unless they can do many of them simultaneously. And everybody's noticed that the human mind, the human brain, can do many of those tasks very quickly. For example, computer vision is a problem that computers can do, but they're relatively slow at it. They do relatively primitive work, and it takes them a lot of time. Whereas, obviously, the human eye, in connection with the human brain, can do it immediately, real time. I mean, here we are. We're, we're, our brains are processing this information very quickly uh, at a very sophisticated level. And yet, we know that the neurons in the human brain are pretty slow compared to a computer, compared to a computer processor. They operate in the micro uh, second range as opposed to the nanosecond range. So, obviously, they're using parallel processing. And that's kind of understood. Nobody knows exactly how, but it is understood that parallel processing can take place. So artificial intelligence researchers are very interested in massively parallel processing, but they don't exactly know how to organize their, their programs. They're all different. Uh, somebody that's working on computer vision is going to be doing a completely different type of parallel processing than somebody that's working on um, say, understanding text. Totally different problems, different needs. So therefore, you would like to have a computer processor that can process in parallel with any structure you wish to impose on it based on the program needs. So let's take a look a little bit at what some of the hardware is that has worked up until this point. The typical parallel processor that works is what's called a SIMD. So there are three different kinds of processors you might define using this type of nomenclature. An SISD would be um, single instruction, single data processor. That's your, your standard um, um, single processor. Uh, the next type would be single instruction, multiple data. And that is the type that has worked very well. It is in use today in, for example, weather modeling or modeling of uh, airflow over an aircraft or simulating uh, even things like, um, you know, an asteroid coming into the atmosphere. You may have seen these, these wonderful pictures on the public television channel with extraordinary detail of the fluid flow around an object like that. Well, that's all done with these specialized, well, it doesn't have to be, but in the best case, it's done with these types of parallel processors. Weather modeling is a perfect example. Uh, so the, uh, the people that do weather modeling use highly parallel computers, as do the ones that uh, work on atomic bombs. They don't talk about it, but they have the machines. So they are simulating uh, some very sophisticated numerical programming using parallel machines. What makes them special is that every processing element, every processor, rather, is working on exactly the same instruction at the same time. So, for example, in weather modeling, you're trying to model the weather. So you're looking at all the different things that go into weather, uh, wind speed in different directions. You're looking at pressure. You're looking at temperature, maybe density, humidity, all these things have to be looked at at each geographic point within your weather system. So you assign one little part of that one cell, so to speak, of that entire weather system to one processor. And by assigning them across the board to all the processors, you manage to model the entire weather system. But at every point, you're doing the same calculation. First, you're computing the humidity. Then you're multiplying that by the wind speed. Whatever it is you're doing, all the processors are performing the same task. And then once you've computed, let's say, an update to the humidity, temperature, pressure, etc., uh, at each point in space, you then 
transfer that information to its nearest neighbor, which represents the cell that would be physically next door in geography. That's the kind of work that's very easy to do on this type of architecture, and it's an extremely successful machine. Unfortunately, we don't need a whole lot of these, but they are very powerful and very capable, providing that's all you want to do is weather modeling or airflow. Uh, so aviation companies, aerospace companies use these types of machines as well. Not very useful, though, as soon as you get away from this type of problem where you're looking at transferring information between nearest neighbors and each processor doing exactly the same task, the same program. So that's single instruction, multiple data, or basically single program operated on every processor. So what do we do if we want to get away from that? Well, and I'm afraid I, um, well, let, me, let me back it up for a moment. Let, let's go back to this structure. Let me do it this way. So what would you do if you had a general purpose parallel processor? Well, the first thing you have to worry about is, okay, I'm, I can imagine where I might have uh, each processor is an independent machine, each one with its own memory. And then I have an interconnection network that we hope can connect anything to anything. So imagine that interconnection network operating somewhat like a telephone network. Suppose everybody or half the people in the United States simultaneously pick up the telephone and call the other half. Let's, let's hope they do it without conflict. So no, you're not trying to get business signals. You just want to get to the person you know is waiting for your phone call. So that's a one-to-one -one connection. Everybody has somewhere they're coming from and somewhere they're, they're sending their information to. How would you do that if people are constantly hanging up the phone and changing who they want to talk to? Even if there's no conflict, so we're not worried about the fact that two people might try to call the same person. That's not the issue. The issue is you've got a structure where you have to have an interconnection arrangement that can change itself on the fly and continue to transmit information in parallel from every processor to another equal partner. That, it turns out, is a very difficult task. So the first thing you want to do is ask yourself, okay, if I could do that, how would I program it? So not only do I have to worry about the hardware, but I have to worry about how I'm going to actually run such a thing. One of the approaches is what you might call a static approach, which is to say, all right, I'm going to tell the programmer he has to figure out how to make the, not so much how to make the connections, not the, not the interconnection part itself, but he has to figure out at every step what program he's going to run and which processor uh, he's going to have to provide the data for that processor in the local memory, and then he's going to have to figure out who to send it to. Okay, that's the programming task. In other words, the entire scheduling of the, of the parallel system is left to the, to the programmer. It turns out that's extremely difficult to do in a situation where you might have a thousand processors, 10,000 processors, because just think about the typical process. It's not that deterministic. It depends on data. As you do the programming, as excuse me, as you execute the program, new data is going to introduce variables that you can't predict in advance. You're going to be making decisions. You know, you've got your branch statements in your program that are going to determine whether you loop back or keep going or do something else. Each of those is going to introduce um, a new variable that you can't control by programming in advance the schedule. So trying to decide in advance how to program each processor to do the job is not only difficult, it's practically impossible. So the alternative is not to do that. Fortunately, we have today, and in fact, we've had it for a long time, a way of programming that allows one to program without knowing when the steps are going to execute. And that would be called event-driven processing or event-driven programming. Your typical object-oriented programming is based on the idea that you create programming objects of some sort and you link them together, and when they're ready to go, they go. 
Now that's not exactly what I'm showing here, but the idea is in the same vein. Parallel programmers have come up with this notion that you have a program element. You have input slots, places where you're going to provide from previous steps all of the input data that that particular pro process step needs to execute, and then a bunch of output slots where you're going to put the results with, with destinations as to where they're going to go. Those, these are typically not going to be just an individual, a single step in a program. It's going to be a whole subset or a function or some something that you can identify as an individual programming element that, that can stand alone and that you don't really want to break down any further because it just gets too cumbersome. But the idea then is you link all these together and the way they're linked together is these output slots have addresses in them, and the addresses would be the addresses of the destination process that needs the data, that's waiting for the data to arrive before it can turn around and become an active process. So that would be a program element. Well, then how are you going to achieve this result? So I'm showing here something called a batcher by tonic sort. Let's, before we get into that, let me, let me show you what it is, or let me explain to you rather, what it is you need to have uh, at each end of the process. So let me get back to this, the programming element. You need to be able first to provide the input data. Once you have that, then this process is going to identify itself as being ready to execute. So it's sitting in a memory and it, sets a flag it you know throws its hand up and says hey i'm ready to go at that point what needs to happen is that processing element which is sitting in memory and it's really just a you know a piece of code with some data attached to it uh, is going to have to be sent to an empty processor and it can then execute well the nice thing about that is that every empty processor looks the same they're all identical so you don't have to do it in any particular order. All you have to do is identify these programming elements that are ready to execute. They, they have a flag that's raised that says, hey, I'm ready to go. And you have to connect them to an inc equally indistinguishable set of empty processors. That, it turns out, is a solved problem. And I'm going to show you, this is a structure that can do it where on the left here, where it says ascending sort and descending sort, you would have two um, pre-sorted sets of, let's say, these programming elements with their flags raised. How, how does that work? Well, on the very far left, it would be the inputs to this structure. The inputs would be all of those memory locations. And since the memory locations are actually attached to the processors, you're going to use the processors not only to do processing, they're going to have to multitask because they're also going to act as the kind of control elements in this data movement process. So when I show you this structure, um, this is somewhat more, um, let's say, figurative than real because in reality, you're just going to have links between them and you're going to let the processors do the switching. But what happens is you've got on the left side a mixed set of memory elements that have program elements that are ready to go and others that are not. You want to separate the two. You don't want the ones that are not ready to go to go anywhere. They're waiting. The ones that are ready to go, you want to move them through the system and have them come out on the other end in a sorted order. Now, the sorted order simply means you want to bunch up all of the ones that are ready to go, let's say at the very beginning on the output side where the word sorted is, that would be, you know, you pack them up to the top. So all the links for ones that are not ready to go would be at the bottom of that, that sequence. And you can do that, it turns out, in log n stages. Okay, now what's, what's interesting about that is, if you ask yourself what it takes to move information from one location to a, a possible set of n destinations, you're going to need a structure with, let's say you have two position switches. So you're going to make, you know, binary decisions, left or right. When you do that, 
you're going to need log n stages. And if you consider that you might have n items on the left side wanting to move all the way through the structure to the right side, every stage is going to have to have n paths. So how many parts do you need? Well, you need n log n with a depth of log n. That's the absolute minimum theoretically necessary to do the task. And this structure will provide it. Uh, I don't want to go, I could spend a lot of time going through how it works. If you look it up, you'll see that if all you're trying to do is separate, you know, the, the zeros from the ones, let's say the ones that are ready from the ones that aren't ready, you can do it with this structure and move all of the ready, you know, flagged raised programming elements over to all of the empty processors and link them together one to one. And that is an optimal solution. So that problem is solved. So you've got programming elements ready to go. You just move them over to the empty processors and bang, they start processing as soon as they, they, the data gets there. The program runs, the input data provides the results that are needed. And now the next step comes, and that is you have to send it back to the next step. Well, now it's not so easy. Because at this point, what you have is it's no longer a matter of sending it to indistinguishable destinations. You have to send the exact data to the exact processing element that's waiting for it in the exact slot that's waiting for it. Okay, so you need to you need to have a specific destination for each item. Now you have that. It's in the processing element. The destination is given as a memory address. But to do it is not so easy. In fact, it turns out that it's been determined that it can be done with n log n switches. So binary switches, you need n log n. Okay, where log, by the way, is, is uh, bait log base 2. So, for example, if you had 64 um, destinations okay, and 64 sources, and you wanted to arbitrarily send them on a one-to-one -one permutation mapping from source to destination, the minimum number of two-position switches you would need is n times, I said 64, so... Uh, 64 is 2 to the, what is it, 2 to the 6th. <laughs> so you would need 64 times 6. That's how many switches you would need. Well, how do we know that, that that's actually feasible? In other words, that is a bound. It is an absolute theoretical minimum. Can it be done? Well, here's a network that does it. It's called the Banesh network. It's been around since the 1930s, I believe. It was first proposed as a switching system for the telephone network. And it was very compact compared to the types of switches they were using. So what's wrong with it? Why don't we just consider problem solved? Go home, everybody's happy. The problem is, while this thing has this optimal number of switches, in order to actually program it, they have to be programmed one at a time. It is inherently sequential, the programming process. So here you have a network that if you can only program it immediately, you could go home. We'd be done. But the darn thing takes forever to program. So you'd be sitting around waiting for it to finish programming itself just to send one pass of data, and then they have to do it all over again. That's not practical. So this machine is theoretically optimal. In practice, it's practically useless. It's a nice, nifty structure that isn't used. <laughs> Even the telephone system, I think, does not use it. So, which they could probably uh, if they wanted to, because after all, people make phone calls over a period of time, unlike computers, where we're talking about a very quick uh, uh, set of uh, processing steps, and then boom, you want to go do uh, something else. So each one is going to be different. So you have to be able to rearrange this network, as it's called, a rearrangeable network, on the fly very quickly. And this doesn't do it. It's wonderful, but it doesn't do it. So what's next? Well, let me mention that both the Bitonic uh, sort and this Banesh network can actually physically be implemented on something called the hypercube. Uh, and I, uh, yes, I did spell it correctly. <laughs> it doesn't look like, but in any case, 
So what's the hypercube? Well, a hypercube is a structure that has been built. There was actually a company of, uh, a few years ago called N-Cube that was trying to sell these things. Each little dot here uh, is a processor, and the lines in between them are connection links. And this is a physical structure that looks like, if you look at the piece on the left there, it's a cube. If you look at the piece on the right, it's a cube. Um, well, each node, uh, each processor in each of those cubes is tied to the one that looks just like it in the other cube. And you can actually keep doing that. You can build structures as big as you want using this approach. And if you look at how many, for instance, if we, if we count the number of little dots in this thing, uh, I think we've got uh, eight in each cube, uh, 16 all together. And you, if you look at each of those dots, the nodes, the processors, the total number of links uh, connected to each processor is four. So two to the four is 16. It works nicely. This thing would then be able to accept the, the process that you have in the Banesh network or in the Bitonic sorting network into this structure, even though it doesn't quite look like it, it would turn out to be equivalent. And this is a practical machine. It's been used, and in fact, uh, some uh, programmers have even developed uh, uh, programs that are almost optimal. In other words, that can allow you to move information and almost log in time in parallel in this structure. Not quite, not good enough, but close. So why not stay with this? Well, actually we could. This is not a bad solution because of the fact that just because you're not optimal doesn't mean you're not good, especially if you're not worried about huge numbers. You know, the log of a thousand, <clears throat> the log of a thousand twenty-four log base two is ten. So for example, the batcher by tonic sort, if you carry that algorithm from beginning to end, it's the number of steps is log in squared, whereas I said optimal would be log n. Well, if you're dealing with a thousand processors, log n squared gives you a penalty of 10 times. So you're going to be 10 times slower. That sounds awful, but actually that's pretty darn good. You're, you're 10 times slower than the, the most perfect machine you could ever design. So that's still pretty good, but it hasn't been done yet. And the reason is people want, we're still at the theoretical stage, people are working on the theory, they're trying to develop a solution that is perfect. And it turns out we're, we're, we have a hint of the perfect solution. It doesn't quite exist yet, but it's been shown to exist. So there are some mathematicians that have developed a solution where they say, if, if we can construct this type of structure, and I'll explain it in a moment, this expander graph structure, then we could have optimal systems. They already have developed programs for them using their properties. They've also developed a proof of existence. And in fact, they've even developed some that are where you can actually build them. The problem is while they are optimal in theory, they have ridiculously large constants associated, with like 400. So you would have to build um, a machine that had, you know, a hundred zillion processor before the thing became uh, better than, than, say, the batcher by tonic sort approach. Because you'd have to have uh, an enormous value of n for the log of it to be uh, sufficiently small. Or, or excuse me, sufficiently uh, large that the square of it would be too big. I guess that's what I'm getting at. So let me tell you what an expander graph is. And it's a mathematical concept. And there are, uh, there are different definitions. There are just plain expander graphs. And then there are what I'm showing in this picture, which is a bipartite expansion graph. And the bipartite is exactly what you would think. It's the fact that you've got a left side and a right side. And all of your, what you're trying to do is link the stuff on the left to the parts on the right. The big box with a question mark in the middle is the part they don't know how to make. They know they exist. They can prove they exist. Uh, there's a fellow named Nicholas Pippinger, a great computer scientist, that has proven that there is such a thing and that it's actually quite efficient. But he used a counting argument where he basically said, if you start with this structure and I count all the ones that I could generate that don't work, 
they progressively go to zero as n goes to infinity. Well, that's nice to know, but it doesn't help you build one. So what is the structure? Well, an expanded graph has nodes on the left. Mathematicians call them vertices. And those lines they call edges. Uh, engineers like to call them links or wires. But it's the same idea. The box in the middle has no switches. It's just a set of lines from left to right in some unknown configuration. But each of those nodes on the left has to have a fixed number of wires leaving it. And, all the, and on the right, since you've got N on both left and right, the number of links on the right is also going to be uh, a fixed number. In this case, K equals three. So you can see three wires. The beauty of this thing is that it has some properties that make it possible to take uh, each of these and use it to build a divide and conquer structure on an unsorted set of inputs. By divide and conquer, what I mean is you take those inputs and you split them in half. Half go to the left, the other half go to the right. You do that log in times, you're done. You basically divide and conquer, you know, in a sort of a tree structure down to the point where every source is now tied to a single destination and you're finished. And this structure, because it has the total number of switches, would be, if you look at each source, you've got one input tied to three wires, so you have to, you have, to have a three-position selector switch. On the output side, you've got three possible sources of your destination data. Coming in, you grab one of them, and bang, it goes out. So the total number of switches would be n times, well, if you want to count three as a three-position switch, is, that's a number. So the total number of uh, switches would be on the order of k times n. Since k is a constant, you basically this entire structure is on the order of n. And so therefore, if you build log n stages, it's order n log n, which is optimal. The way this structure, the, the special property this structure has, besides what I've shown you here, is it has to be linked, all these, the stuff inside the box has to be designed such that you can select any subset of those inputs up to a certain maximum size, like for example, 50% of n and guarantee that no matter what subset you pick, the total number of output nodes that's connected to that subset is one and a half times as much. Or, I mean, they actually, you know, every expander graph has a number like 1.5 or 1.3. The typical is 1.5. So here you have, for example, n over 2, you pick them at random. Any subset you want, I guarantee you that if you pick n over 2 or anything less than that, that the total number of output nodes you'll be connected to is n over 2 times 1.5. What does that do? Well, it doesn't sound like it does much, but it turns out some people have developed an algorithm. In fact, there's a couple of different algorithms that have been developed to use that property in order to move information in log n steps from a set of inputs to a set of fixed outputs. And they can be used in one case, one of the algorithms does sorting, and the other one it does what's called routing. In routing, you know the destination, and sorting, you just put them in order. Okay, so looks like I'm getting close to the end here, and I think that may be my last slide, so that would make sense that I'm reaching the end. How are we going to use this expander graph? Back up. It goes right here on that interconnection network. The processors are going to do double duty, both moving information from their local memory to other local memories and other processors, so they will act as the control elements. That interconnection structure will, at most, you're going to have those three switch settings, so you can have three wires or whatever number it is coming out of the processors, going into that interconnection network, coming out the other end and going to a processor. 
the processor then will dump it into the right memory location in its own memory. And if that processing or program element has all the data it needs to execute, it'll grab it. And if it's not busy, it'll keep it. If it is busy, it'll send it into the network using the algorithms that we know and, and find a processor that isn't busy. If you don't like to make the processors do all the work, you can have two sets of processors. You can have the processors that do the computing and the processors that do the control work for the interconnection network. And that may be a better approach because you can dedicate them. It all depends on whether you really want to have dedicated processors or not. Whatever's cheaper. Right now, what we're looking at is this is a concept that would be used by researchers. So we're not worried about the details because we haven't got to the point where, we, where it's worth trying to build one. We're still trying to conceive of one. But when we do, what are the kind of problems we might look at? Well, picture a problem that you would like to solve where you know there's a certain amount of parallelism in the data, in the uh, instruction set, but it's not ordered. It's not a simple, you know, lockstep like that, that SIMD processor that does weather modeling. You've got a lot of different things going on. Uh, you might be trying to do searching for uh, solutions in artificial intelligence where you've got uh, a bunch of information that's, that's very complex. You know, you're trying to do a, um, a chess game and you have to consider all kinds of different possibilities. Uh, if you're trying to build a computer that learns, my goodness, well, what does it take to learn? Uh, we don't actually know that either. but there's a lot of theories about what might work in the way of learning, except that they involve a lot of searching and a lot of culling through data and a lot of filtering and trying to condense raw information down into useful information and then figuring out where to put it so that when you try to remember something or link it to something else that's coming in, it'll be available to you, but you don't know how that's going to work because it depends on the data. It depends on the learning process, something you can't predict in advance. That's a typical artificial intelligence question where we actually have no clue how we're going to use the information, but we have some ideas of how to put it together. That's the sort of thing that these massively parallel processes would be useful for if we can only conquer these problems. And, and we really have boiled it down to one problem, this interconnection network that is not quite good enough to be worth building. Uh, if, if we can uh, figure out what is optimal, we may also, in the process, get some insight into how the human brain does it. Because somehow the human brain manages to perform all these functions in parallel, and we have no clue how they do it. Well, how they, meaning your, your neurons in your brain. So how do they work? How do the neurons work? How does the, the brain structure, how is it put together? Well, perhaps if we only understood what works on a computer, we might see if there's a relationship between that and what is done in the human brain. Right now, there's very little information, very little understanding of how the brain structure is actually organized. I mean, they've got all kinds of understanding that, you know, the left side does this and the back of the brain does uh, vision and so forth, but that doesn't help you understand those little neurons, how they're all tied together. How are they actually structured? Not, not how each neuron is connected to the one next to it, but how, what is the overall structure of the flow of information in the brain? We don't know. All right, well, that pretty much wraps up my presentation. I hope you found it interesting. I have written a paper that I am still working on doing the, um, uh, uh, the citations for, and then once I have that done, I will uh, pass it on, and it can be... Uh, hand it out. It's just a tutorial, so um, you might find it interesting. And um, I do wish I had better pictures, but I don't have uh, access to a good uh, drawing package, uh, at least not one that I'm familiar with. So let me, um, at this point, take any questions. Has anybody got a question for me, or have I put you all to sleep? Next typing. So I'm waiting for, for Nick and, and Fuji to type. 
And, uh, and guys, you can ask me any question you want. And if you don't buy what I said, if you think it's nonsense, by all means, tell me. Any thoughts on the old connection machine? Well, yes, the, the connection machine was actually a um, not a hypercube. It was, well, it, it may have been tied to a hypercube, but the guy that developed it, Lyserson, uh, developed something he called a fat tree. A fat tree might have, in a sense, used some elements of a hypercube. Uh, but his idea behind the fat tree was that it would be sort of like a tree structure, except that at every point as you go up the, you know, the tree, up into the, the roots, so to speak, um, instead of choosing, you know, in a typical tree structure, you've got one path and then that divides into two. Well, both paths would continue on up the tree. And the way you would traverse the tree is you would go up as far as you had to so you could go down the, the, the remaining, the, the next leg down to get to your destination. But every one of those nodes, those center points where the, the data was coming in in parallel from below and either going up to a higher level or, or back down the other side, those had to be some sort of interconnection network. And he actually looked at, um, as I understand it, he looked at uh, uh, using one of these uh, theoretical concepts that relies to some extent on, on, uh, on probability to be effective. In other words, you build a structure that you don't exactly know for a fact that it works, but it has a high probability of working because it's been proven that most of them do. And he said, that was a great idea, but it's really hard to sell somebody on spending millions of dollars on a machine where you can only tell them that the, the interconnection structure may work. And in fact, I don't think that that machine is, is in use today. I, I, it was a great idea, and I had thought at the time it was going to continue to be developed. And my understanding is Mr. Le Dr. Lysenson has gone on to do other things. Great question, by the way. Uh, Roger Fuji, I'm an oldie that remember uh, the Intel Hypercube. Yes, it seems to me that the massively parallel computing is now coupled with big data as opposed to um, HPC. What is HPC? I'm sorry, it doesn't ring a bell with me, uh, which it used to be. Is this assessment accurate? Uh, I'm not, I just don't know your high performance computing. Oh, yes. Well, you know, that may be, it may be. I mean, I think people have kind of given up on parallel, massively parallel computing as a um, as a hot topic. It was a hot topic about 20 years ago. I mean, that's how I got into it. Um, it's not. But I think that partly is because there just hasn't been any progress. You know, when you have these unsolved problems, and if you look at the papers that are out there, most of them are from the 1990s and early 2000s. There just isn't anything new. Why? Because they've run into dead ends. I think what's going to happen is somebody will open it back up with some new development that will just hit, you know, hit the field and people will take off again. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, big data is uh, uh, one way to do it. But big data is, is a little bit different, I think, because the problems are, in a sense, specialized. Again, it's, it's kind of like that, that thing I was talking about, the SIMD, where you've got a specific problem that is very amenable to that approach. High-performance computing, on the other hand, is sort of by definition anything you want that goes fast. So you're not really narrowing it down. But big data, uh, you bet. I'm, I'm, I think you're absolutely right. I hope I answered your question. And uh, let me know if you've got more feedback. Roger is typing. And um, I will send out, as I said, a paper with some references so you can take a look at some of the papers that have been written um, covering this topic. Uh, and in fact, Lyserson was a good one with his, uh, with his um, connection machine. A great idea, developed at MIT. Uh, he was, and I think perhaps still is, a professor. Just a sanity check on this, thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, uh, I'm. It looks to me like I haven't quite used up all my time, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else I feel I need to say on the subject. I did uh, write a lot more, but it, it, you reach a point where you, I think you've kind of said what you want to say. And uh, absent coming up with some new approach, I think we're not going to see just a whole lot of progress on this at the moment.
Uh, and it's unfortunate because this is one of those things where if we could develop a truly practical, massively parallel machine, where let's say the cost was linked to the number of processors. I mean, obviously, if you put 10 times as many processors, it ought to cost 10 times as much. And if you can do that and build a machine that will actually make use of that many processors, as opposed to just having them sitting in the box doing nothing, then I think you could have a really useful machine. Uh, and unfortunately, in the absence of certain special problems, these things are just not quite happening. And artificial intelligence is kind of on the same boat. They're both very slow moving uh, system. Let's see, does some of this interconnect become moot when uh, with new processor designs, NIDIA's Pascal chip, 15, uh, 15 transistor chip? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, how can it become oh billion oh yes well now okay that's a that's an interesting one because uh, however many processors you put on on one uh, board if you if you reach the point where you have a whole lot of processors then you start to get into that same issue even if you you think you're you know oh gee I got them all sitting on one chip or on one board uh, it still is an issue. Let, let me point this out. You can build a, an interconnection structure uh, that is sometimes called a crossbar that allows you to in, immediately connect any processor to any other processor. And it, essentially what it has is a switch for every combination. So what that means is if you have, um, let's say you have 100 processors on a single board, that's not a lot. Well, what's 100 times 100? Because that's what you're looking at. You're looking at n squared. In order to have every source connected to every destination, you're looking at the order of n squared or 100 squared connection devices. That gets to be an awful lot. You get to where your, your, your connection scheme is using up most of your space, and the processors themselves are, are a minority in the whole business. Uh, one quick question, you have any interesting examples that one can look at for parallel processing and graphics cards? I don't have them off the top of my head, but I will include that when I, um, uh, when I finish my paper, which I will give to uh, Dr. Camberry. So that's a good question. I would like to give you some examples, and what I have mainly is examples of theoretical work, but I'm going to look and see what is being done. I know that we have uh, parallel machines out there, you know, these quad-core processors by definition are parallel, it's just they're parallel on a very small scale, you know, when you have four, six, eight processors, you know, eight squared is 64, that's not so much. That's not so much interconnection. When you start to get into the hundreds squared, you're looking at a lot of interconnection, and it gets unwieldy. That's why we need to have more efficient systems. Nidia's, I'm, I'm looking again at Nidia's Pascal. I better look up. Uh, I didn't realize a billion transistor, 15 billion. That sounds like an awful lot on one chip. I mean, 15 million seems possible. 15 billion seems a little further than I thought possible. But I believe you. I'm going to look it up. <laughs> wow. 15 billion transistors on a single chip. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. I didn't. I didn't think that was possible. Oof. And that does make a difference. But again, they've got. They're gonna. They'll have the same issues with interconnections. Um, how do you interconnect fifteen? Well, you don't have to interconnect all fifteen billion transistors to each other. But wow, five hundred. Yeah, uh, five hundred million. I, that impresses me. Uh, 15 billion, I'm having trouble swallowing it. I don't know how that happens, but it, obviously it has, and that's impressive. So I'm going to have to look that up. So you're, you're ahead of me on that. I had not followed that. I was unaware that there were that many processors, uh, transistors on a single chip. And that's a single chip, not just a single board. NVIDIA, okay. Wow. Okay, guys. Any other questions?
feel free to ask and you can uh, I think if you if you wish to send me um, uh, some questions, perhaps uh, Dr. Canberry can uh, collect any uh, information you want to ask and, and pass it on to me, and I'll, I'll answer it. I'll be happy to answer your questions, and maybe we can get a conversation going, because this is a field that I was working in a lot in the past, and um, in the recent years, I've, I, I have moved elsewhere because there just wasn't any action. Uh, and yet I don't want to give up on it. And that's why I'm doing this this little tutorial. I want to show you what I know and maybe stimulate some interest from others because you never know where the next breakthrough is going to come from. I've only shown you what I know has been worked on. Uh, and you'll have to look up some of the details on your own. But uh, there, there's always some new field, new angle to it that nobody's really thought of that could bring things back in a different direction. And by the way, many of the papers that I'm going to uh, put into my uh, report uh, are ACM papers. So uh, a lot of the work's been done by people uh, that are in the ACM. All right. Uh, uh, do I need to, I guess I should stop sharing, uh, Dr. Canberry? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Douglas. Um, any other questions before we wrap up here? All right, thank you everyone for attending and thank you so much once again, Dr. Douglas, for your great presentation. Um, once you send me that report, I will go ahead and email it out to our DCACM group on Meetup. Uh, so look out for that. I will be turning this into a YouTube video um, in the next couple of days and I'll have that on our channel as well. Thank you all for attending. Um, have a great rest of the evening. Goodbye. Thanks for coming.